Hey, I'm Rebecca, and I'm 28 years old. I just got married to Richard, who's seven years older than me. Let me tell you about the day we met. It was at a fancy garden party when I was 18 and fresh out of high school. Richard, who was 25 at the time, came up to me with a glass of champagne in hand. He said, Rebecca, right? In a smooth voice. I blushed and replied, and you're Richard? We hit it off, laughing and talking all evening. Our parents saw us together and started thinking about us getting married. A few years later, we did get married, but before that, we signed a prenup. It basically said that if one of us cheated, the other would get $3 million and could leave the marriage. I trusted Richard, so I signed without hesitation. My dad, who doesn't say much but cares a lot, asked if I was sure about it. I told him I trusted Richard and it was just a formality. Richard was there too, and he wanted to make sure I wasn't feeling pressured. But I reassured him that I trusted him and everything was okay. That's how our journey together began. We had a big wedding and moved into a beautiful house. Everything felt perfect, like a fairy tale, especially our honeymoon at a beach resort. But when we got back home, things started to change. Richard became a different person. He was distant, always lost in his thoughts. He'd come home late from work and go straight to bed without saying goodnight. We started sleeping in separate rooms, eating at different times, and hardly spoke. One day, I decided to talk to him about it. Richard, I said, trying to sound steady, what's going on? You've been acting strange since we got back from our honeymoon. He looked at me, his eyes lacking the warmth they once had. I've just been busy with work, Rebecca, he replied, not meaning my gaze. But things didn't get better. Richard kept coming home later, sometimes not until the early hours of the morning. He stopped eating with me, and we barely saw each other. I started to suspect he might be seeing someone else. The thought made me feel sick, but I couldn't ignore the signs. So I confronted him again one night when he came home late. Richard, are you seeing someone else? I asked, tears welling up. He looked shocked. No, Rebecca, I would never do that to you, he insisted. But you're always out. You never spend time with me, I said, feeling hurt. I told you, it's just work, he said firmly. I'm not cheating on you, Rebecca. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Richard wasn't the same man I married. He was distant, cold, and seemed to be hiding something. I didn't know what to do. I loved Richard, but things didn't feel right. But I couldn't go on like this. If Richard wasn't going to tell me what was going on, I had to find out for myself. I felt guilty about invading his privacy, but I needed answers. So, I checked his phone when he was in the shower. I didn't find any suspicious messages or calls, but I found something that worried me deeply. Richard had been searching for apartments. Was he planning to leave me? I confronted him about it. Richard, why are you looking for apartments? Are you planning on leaving me? He looked surprised and denied it, saying he was just browsing. But I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. One day, I talked to my mom about it. She's always been my rock. Mom, I said, I don't know what to do. Richard's changed. He's not the same person anymore. She listened with concern and tried to reassure me that it was just an adjustment period for newlyweds. But deep down, I knew there was more to it. A few weeks later, I gathered my courage and told Richard, I need a job. He was surprised but offered me a position at his foundation, which helps kids in tough situations. I accepted without hesitation. Working there was a breath of fresh air. I was busy, doing something meaningful, and I met inspiring children who had faced unimaginable hardships. But working at the foundation kept me busy and distracted from the problems at home. Richard and I had our issues, but at least during the day, I had something else to focus on. The work was tough, emotionally draining, but it felt worth it. I felt like I was making a difference, doing something important. For the first time in a while, I felt happy. Yet, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was wrong. Richard was acting strange distant. I couldn't pinpoint it but I knew something was off. Determined to find out what it was, I decided to hire a private detective. I needed to know if Richard was cheating on me. It wasn't just about my pride. 
It was about my peace of mind. I couldn't live in constant doubt, wondering what went wrong. I found a detective named Joe, a former cop, tough and straightforward. I told him my suspicions, and he listened attentively. I'll do my best, Rebecca, he said. But I can't promise anything. If your husband is cheating, he's good at hiding it. I understood and urged him to proceed. When Joe returned with his report, his expression was serious. I'm sorry, Rebecca, he said. I couldn't find any evidence that your husband is cheating on you. I felt a strange mix of relief and disappointment. Part of me was glad Richard wasn't cheating, but another part was frustrated. If he wasn't cheating, then why was he acting this way? What was he hiding? Are you sure, Joe? I asked softly. Joe shook his head. I'm sorry, Rebecca. I know this isn't what you wanted to hear. I thanked him and paid for his services, left with more questions than answers. As I watched him go, I felt really sad. It was like I was back at square one with more questions than answers. I was working at a charity when Daniel showed up. He was the new guy, and he was good-looking with a smile that could light up a room. He was smart and funny, too. He seemed perfect, like someone out of a movie. But something didn't sit right with me. His arrival seemed too perfect, like it was planned. I couldn't stop thinking about Richard and the trouble I'd be in if I got caught cheating. Richard had warned me about it, saying I'd have to pay him three million dollars. Was Daniel part of a trap Richard set for me? I decided to hire Joe, the private detective I used before, to look into Daniel and see if he was connected to Richard. Joe agreed and started digging into Daniel's past and connections. Meanwhile, I tried to keep my distance from Daniel, even though he was so charming and attractive. I couldn't afford to fall into a trap, especially with so much at stake. One day, Daniel asked me out for coffee, and I didn't know what to do. Part of me wanted to say yes and get to know him better. But another part of me was scared, worried about what Joe might find. I'd love to, Daniel. I said, trying to sound steady. But I'm really busy right now. Maybe some other time. Daniel seemed disappointed, but he didn't push. Sure, Rebecca, he said, his smile fading slightly. Some other time. I felt a pang of guilt. What if I was wrong? What if Daniel was just a nice guy, and I was letting my suspicions ruin a potentially good thing? But I couldn't take the risk, not until I knew for sure. A few days later, Joe came to give me his report. His face was serious, his eyes hard. I'm sorry, Rebecca, he said, but your suspicions were right. Daniel is working for your husband. Husband. I felt a rush of emotions. Anger at Richard for trying to trap me, relief that I hadn't fallen for it, sadness that Daniel wasn't who I thought he was. But above all, I felt a sense of vindication. I wasn't crazy. My suspicions were valid. Thank you, Joe, I said, my voice choked. You've done a great job. As I watched Joe leave, I felt a strange sense of closure. I had dodged a bullet, avoided a costly mistake. But I had also lost something the image of the ideal man, the hope of finding love again. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but I wasn't going to let this get me down. I was stronger than that. I was going to move on, to find happiness again. I didn't need an ideal man. I just needed someone who was real, who was honest, and I was going to find that person no matter what. I could have sent Daniel packing right then and there, but I decided to take a different route. I chose to play along, to befriend him, all the while making sure to keep my behavior above board, not giving Richard any reason to point fingers at me. Daniel, however, took my friendliness as a sign of something more. He started to loosen up, thinking he had me charmed. The irony was he was the one getting played, but I didn't let Daniel in on the secret. I couldn't risk him running back to Richard, so I kept up the act, maintaining the friendly facade. One day, I decided to step it up a notch. I asked Daniel to join me for lunch, making it sound like a casual chat about charity work. He agreed with a smug smile on his face, thinking he was making progress. We found a quiet spot in the cafe. So, Daniel, I began, how are you finding the charity work? He shrugged, looking confident. It's good, different but good. And Richard? I asked, 
trying to sound casual. What do you think of him? Daniel looked surprised. Richard? He's okay, I guess. Why? I shrugged, trying to look nonchalant. Just curious. He's a bit of an enigma, isn't he? Daniel laughed, clearly relieved. Yeah, he can be a hard one to read. We continued chatting about work and life. I made sure to keep my tone neutral, not giving him any reason to be suspicious. In the following days, I continued to play along, keeping up the friendly act and never crossing the line. I was always on my guard, always careful. It was a risky game, but one I was willing to play for now. During one of our lunch meetings, Daniel looked at me, a serious look on his face. You know, I've been thinking, he said, raising an eyebrow, sending a chill down my spine. About what? I asked, trying to hide my unease. He shrugged, looking uncomfortable. About us? About this thing we have? I felt my heart skip a beat. This was it? The moment I had been dreading. I forced a smile on my face. And what is it that we have, Daniel? He looked at me, a hopeful look in his eyes. I think we have something special. I felt a pang of guilt. Daniel was falling into my trap, just as I had planned. But it didn't feel right. It didn't feel good. But I had to keep up the act, had to keep playing the game. So I smiled at Daniel, a fake smile plastered on my face. Yes, Daniel, I said, my voice barely a whisper. We do have something special. And just like that, I had set the trap. The game was on. But at what cost? The Cold War at home with Richard was as icy as ever. We'd occasionally run into each other, exchange chilly greetings, and then retreat to our separate corners, most nights. He'd be at his apartment, claiming it was more convenient for his work commute. One Sunday afternoon, I dialed Daniel's number, lacing my voice with warmth as fake as his documents, inviting him over to my place. He probably thought I was finally ready to give in to his advances. Poor guy, he couldn't have been more wrong. As Daniel stepped into my home, he was greeted not by a seductive housewife, but by my old classmate, now a stern-faced police officer. He'd agreed to help me out, and the surprise on Daniel's face was worth every bit of it. The officer checked Daniel's papers, and as expected, they were as fake as a $3 bill. Now it was time for my move. I offered Daniel a choice. He could either stick with Richard and face the consequences of his fake documents, or he could switch sides and work for me. Daniel's eyes darted between me and the officer, and after a moment of silence he nodded. He agreed to my deal. Checkmate. Richard. With that, the real game began. I had Richard's pawn now playing for my side. But I knew this was just the beginning. Richard was a crafty man. He wouldn't go down without a fight. In the days that followed, I kept a close watch on Daniel. Despite his agreement, I knew I couldn't fully trust him. He was a wild card, a potential threat. But for the time being, he was a useful one. One day, I summoned Daniel to my office. We need to talk, I said, my tone serious. He looked at me, a hint of unease in his eyes. About what? he asked. About Richard, I replied. I need to know everything, his plans, his strategies, everything. Daniel hesitated, then nodded. Okay, I'll tell you everything I know. And just like that, I had my insider. My counterattack was ready. But this was just the beginning. The real battle was still ahead of us. Richard wouldn't go down without a fight, and I had to be prepared. I had to be ready because this wasn't just a game anymore. It was war, and in war, there are no rules, only survival. Days turned into weeks, and I was getting antsy. I wanted to confront Richard to show him I wasn't the pushover he thought I was. Joe, who I turned to once again, had given me some advice. Push Richard. Make him think you've fallen into his trap, he suggested. It was a gamble, but I was ready to play the game. So Daniel and I staged a photo shoot. We posed in ways that could be seen as compromising, as proof of an affair. But we were careful. We kept the originals where everything was as innocent as a Sunday school picnic. Once the photos were ready, I gave them to Daniel. Give these to Richard, I said, handing over the envelope. Let him draw his own conclusions. 
Daniel looked at me, concern etched on his face. You sure about this? he asked. Once you start this, there's no going back. I know, I replied, a steely resolve in my voice. And I'm ready. The very next day, Richard was all smiles at dinner. He thought he'd caught me, that he'd got one over me. But he didn't say a word about it. But I wasn't worried. I knew what was coming. I was ready. Meanwhile, Joe was on the case. He was digging up dirt on Richard, finding all the evidence we needed. He was good at his job, and I trusted him. And finally, Joe called. Richard relaxed and lost his caution, he said, his voice rough with satisfaction. I've got him. I've got all the proof of Richard's cheating, photos, videos, the whole shebang. I felt a rush of excitement. Good, I said, a smile spreading across my face. Let's bring him down. But I didn't confront Richard, not yet. I wanted him to think he was winning. I wanted to see the look on his face when he realized he'd been played. So I waited, playing the part of the dutiful wife, waiting for Richard to make his move. I knew it was coming, and I was ready. The clock was ticking towards the family dinner. I knew this was it, the showdown. I felt a strange calmness. I was ready. The dinner was at Richard's parents' mansion, a sprawling estate that reeked of old money. Richard was there, of course, playing the doting son and husband. But I knew the truth, and soon everyone else would too. We were halfway through the main course when Richard cleared his throat. He stood up, a smug smile playing on his lips. I have something to say, he announced, his eyes on me. He pulled out a set of photos, photos of me with Daniel. He tossed them on the table like he was playing a winning hand. Proof, he said his voice filled with triumph, of my wife's infidelity. The room went quiet. I could feel everyone's eyes on me, but I didn't flinch. I was ready for this. I calmly stood up, meeting Richard's gaze. Yes, I said, my voice steady. I know this man, but he's not my lover. He's an actor hired by you, Richard, to frame me. I pulled out my phone and hit play. The room filled with Daniel's voice, confessing everything. Richard's smile faltered, his eyes widened in shock, but I wasn't done. I pulled out my own set of photos and videos, evidence of Richard's own affairs. I tossed them on the table. What about these, Richard? I asked, my voice cold. Can you explain them? Richard stammered, tried to deny it. But the evidence was undeniable. His parents' faces turned to stone. My parents, who had been quiet until now, spoke up. You ungrateful brat. My father roared at Richard. We trusted you with our daughter. And this is how you repay us? Richard's mother was in tears. How could you, Richard? She sobbed. How could you do this to us, to her? The aftermath was swift. We divorced. Richard's parents, furious at their son's deceit, fired him from their company. His reputation was in tatters. And me? I walked away with three million dollars in compensation. Now Richard is joeless, scrambling to pick up the pieces of his life. And me? I'm free. I'm enjoying the peace, the silence. I'm enjoying my life without Richard. I won. I took on Richard and won. I outsmarted him, played his own game better than he did. And it feels good. It feels right.